Interestingly, I would say that most of the debate around nuclear submarines is around capability, and there are a lot of, uh, I'm going to be impolite and say armchair, experts out there who are clamoring for us to go down that path. Um, and what they're missing uh, is that there's a much broader dimension to going to nuclear versus uh, a conventional capability. Uh, where that really starts is, and let's just start with the people, uh, the crew sizes are much larger. We already have a problem um, uh, with our recruiting challenge at the moment with the Navy. They're working hard to address that, but we're short people. Um, we're starting with a small base of qualified submariners at the moment. And so to grow that capacity to fit a submarine a fleet that was nuclear is you know, impossible to imagine as far as I'm concerned. Not only from there, from the, the, the sheer challenge of creating a, the right number of people and training them, but there's also the enormous impact on the costs for the Navy if, you know, you're going to have a crew of 100 per boat versus potentially 30. Uh, you know, the, the impact on the Navy overall is huge. So that's the first thing I'd say. Then the second thing I would say uh, is the infrastructure requirements for nuclear. You know, the refueling of reactors, um, the nuclear energy, the, also the training of nuclear experts to go to sea in submarines. Uh, all of those kinds of aspects also create enormous obstacles. So now let's turn to the capability side. Oh, yes, of course you can get anywhere you want to go in the world faster in a nuclear submarine. Um, you can sustain unsubmerged operations for longer periods of time because of the near limitless amount of energy you have to, you know, to, uh, create the air, or the, the environment, the energy, create water, fresh water, all the things that you can do in a, a submarine, you know, an almost unlimited nuclear submarine in an almost unlimited capacity. You know, those are all great things. But then let's look at where do we really expect to operate? And what's the environment going to be when we do so? And you've heard me mention before that the Arctic is changing rapidly. Let's not pick a submarine that's designed to go under a polar ice gap of many meters of ice when there's really no need for us to be under the, under the North Pole itself because our allies are there. What we want to be is fundamentally in the approaches to our own archipelago. Um, from an Arctic perspective, and we can achieve all of that uh, in the environment that we can expect in 2040 and beyond with a conventional submarine. So all of that, to me, says that reopening the door to analysis to go back and take a look at a nuclear submarine, we've already mentioned how tight we are on schedule. The last thing we need is another analysis that will identify all the problems that the Navy already knows. Uh, it's the Navy. Uh, and I've had this conversation with the commander of the Navy. They don't want a nuclear submarine for all of those reasons, uh, because it's going to be a bridge too far. Bob, thank you for those insights. Luke? Uh, thanks, Josh, and thanks, Bob. I, I, I couldn't agree more, but a few, maybe a few different vectors to, to address where people's mindset may be around this. I think for all the, the reason uh, Bob described nuclear submarines for replacing this class of submarines. It makes no sense. Like it, we can't get there. Uh, even the production capability in our allies is already under stress on the AUKUS with, with the Australians coming on board now. Uh, you know, the U.S. is not making their, their own domestic production requirements. Uh, it's going to be, it, you know, it's going to be a long run for, for the Australians and the British have similar problems uh, when it comes to that. That's very, if you want to go there as a nation building, long-term planning, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's the submarines after the next lapse. If we want to have the discussion started today, maybe in, in 30 years we'd be ready and would have built the capacity through time and, and, and with our allies to get there. But do we really need to be, uh, to be there? And there's a discussion with our allies, particularly in continental defense, being the U.S., as to how do we complement each other. And I think if you you talk to a lot of strategists, uh, they say, you know, it'd be great that you have very capable diesels to complement us in the continental defense spectrum, because that allows us to do things that their boats can do, and 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 that be a, a welcome things. So I I I, I, I would put that, uh, and and the country needs to, uh, and this is not a, you know, 
we can turn into criticism, but the level of investment when it comes to how much Canada, how much Canadians through their democratic decisions at election time are willing to spend on defense to sustain capabilities and be able to 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 defend the homeland uh, comes to play a lot because that infrastructure is, is, is usually specialized, very expensive. And uh, as I used to joke, jokingly tell, tell friends when they ask me, I say, well, there's a clear way to make sure what 3% of GDP uh, in defense spending, you, you know, uh, acquire a nuclear submarine fleet. Uh, that, that, that'll get you there fairly quickly. So uh, those are the things I would add on to what uh, Bob has contributed. Luke, thanks for those reflections. I appreciate them. Uh, Mark, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Well, I'll give you a couple things that uh, will likely help you to transition to the AUKUS discussion, because I suspect that's where you're going to want to take us next, because um, Bob mentioned it. I, I agree with everything Bob and Luke have said. Uh, I would add um, the refinement of uh, two issues. One is the cost. Um, it will be exorbitant. Um, we're, we're being we're being polite, and it, it it would bankrupt the armed forces if you want to put it that way. Um, and the second is the politics. Um, and it concerns me n not just because um, it's I'm going to go as far as to say it's a great idea that's not practical or realistic. So so let's just move on. Uh, the issue is that um, we we politicize major defense procurements in this country. Uh, it's not unusual, but it is problematic. And when we politicize them, um, often bad things happen or unhelpful things happen. And there is a, a history of governments coming and governments going and making arbitrary and arguably stupid uh, decisions that then cost time, money, and capability uh, over the life cycle of the armed forces. Um, throwing a nuclear submarine option into the mix will be extremely unhelpful. I suspect the Aussies themselves are going to be, we're already starting to see the challenges that, that they're uh, experiencing, and I suspect they're going to get harder uh, as this goes forward. And um, I think there's a lot of other high-end capabilities across the full spectrum of the inventory of the Air Forces that could be far more useful uh, strategically than uh, pursuing this option. 